Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now my guest today, I'm delighted to say, is one of Britain's best-known columnists. Melanie Phillips was in fact the very first person to come and speak to the New Culture Forum when we were founded in 2006. She now writes a column for The Times, but before that she's written extensively for The Guardian, for The Observer, for The Sunday Times. She's also written numerous books, perhaps most famously, All Must Have Prizes, which was about the left-wing capture of our education system, Londonistan, which was about radicalization in London, and The World Turned Upside Down, which was basically about, well, the world turned upside down. Uh, she's with <laughs> me now. Uh, thanks very much for coming, uh, Melanie. Um, I wanted to start because we are filming this just about a week before we are meant to be leaving the EU. You wrote a piece uh, very recently about the deal uh, and your attitude. Can you tell us what you think of it? Um, well, uh, the deal is, in my view, um, a variation on Mrs May's infamous deal, which was deemed so terrible, the House of Commons voted it down no fewer than three times. Now. Uh, Boris Johnson has improved on that deal uh, in that he has removed the backstop, the infamous backstop, and he's altered one or two, got one or two other things altered. But basically it remains Mrs May's deal, and the great mistake I think that he has made, and that so many uh, opponents of Mrs May's deal made, was to focus entirely, almost entirely, on the backstop, which mm. was terrible, but nevertheless there were other bad things about the deal, particularly, but not exclusively, uh, the way it ties up our ability to act independently in the military sphere, in spheres of foreign policy, and the way in which through the political declaration um, it ties any future trade deal that the UK would do with the EU uh, broadly to the principles of um, the single market um, and European rules and regulations. So mm. although we would be out of the EU, we would be tied to its rules and regulations in a way that would prevent this country from capitalizing on its independence to do trade deals in its own interest, which is <laughs> a lot of the point of leaving the European mm -hmm. Union. So uh, in my view, although Boris poses as you know the most Brexity prime minister anyone can think of, um, uh, he's actually just produced Mrs. May's deal, Mark IV, um, an improved version, but still it would leave Britain in a very parlous situation. And to my horror, I have observed the uh, European Research Group of parliamentary Brexiteers, including those who were called Spartans because they would die in the ditch to secure a proper clean break Brexit. Um, they've all caved. And the reason they've caved isn't entirely clear to me, but I would guess it's basically um, uh, warfare fatigue. Mm. They fear that if they don't take this kind of last chance deal, mm. then they won't get Brexit at all. Mm. They fear that they will never get a more Brexity prime minister than Boris Johnson. And I think they've been seduced by the charisma and the story he is very cleverly and not untruthfully woven around himself, that he is defending mm parliamentary, he is defending democracy and the sovereignty of the people and the right of the people to have their democratic wishes uh, fulfilled by their democratically elected representatives. He is defending that against a kind of rolling coup by Remainer MPs, by Remainer Parliament, which is a coup against democracy, a coup against the sovereignty of the people, in which the constitution of the country has been basically gaily ripped up. Mm. And that's all true. But because he's in that position of, and of saying, this is what I'm doing, the mystique has grown that he's actually defending Brexit. But he's not, because now we have the almost impossibly entangled situation in which a prime minister who is genuinely fighting a rearguard action uh, by people who are determined to subvert the sovereignty of the people is doing so by promoting a deal which itself would not be Brexit. Mm. So this is a really horrendous situation, mm -hmm. uh, which, as we can all see, at this moment in time talking to you, yep. uh, we don't know what's going to happen from one hour to the next, let alone how we're going to get out of this. Well, uh, yes, it, it, it is meant to be next week on the 31st, isn't it? I mean, what, I say, when I ask you what do you think will happen, it, it seems to me that um, everyone thought 
that if we sail past the 31st, that's Boris destroyed. But that doesn't appear to be happening, does it? No, and I didn't think that either. On the contrary, I always thought that, his, that the story he needs to tell at the general election, whenever it comes, mm. is that I, Boris Johnson, have tried my very best mm. to do the best for this country, to honour parliament, to honour uh, uh, um, uh, 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 democracy, to honour the sovereignty of the people and the right of the people to have their voice heard, mm. and to honour the referendum result of 2016. Mm. And I've done my best, but look what's happened. The Remainer parliament has succeeded in thwarting me. I am now going to the country on the basis that I am the defender of democracy and your right to have your, your sovereign right to have your voice heard. Now, in my view, if he were to do so by saying, and therefore I will come out without a deal, he would clean up, yeah, right. he would destroy the Brexit party. Because as things stand, if he's going to go into an election whenever it is, saying on the one hand, I'm defending democracy, on the other hand, this is my deal, and that's what I'm standing yeah. for. The Brexit party, i.e. Nigel Farage, is going to come forward and say, this is not Brexit, he is betraying you. And as a result, the Tory vote is going to be split mm. between the Tories and the Brexit party. And also, um, you see, if Boris were to go for a clean break, a no deal, I believe he would then do what people have always thought was completely impossible, he would get die-hard Labour constituencies to vote Tory. Mm. Because I think it's hard to exaggerate the fury mm. of the working class Brexit vote. They understand exactly mm. they have been betrayed. And they would even vote for Boris if he were to make this very clear mm. stand. But if he doesn't, then that vote's going to be split. And of course, we can see the Labour vote will be split between Labour and mm. the newly resurgent Liberal Democrats who become, for the sake of this argument, the Remainer party. Mm -hmm. And so we would face a situation of complete chaos, mm. a complete uncertainty, in which it's quite likely we would again end up with a hung parliament. Yeah. Maybe with Labour being a minority party governing with the help of the Lib Dems, the SNP, whoever. Mm. Or it could be the Tories as another uh, minority party, we don't know. But if Boris Johnson were to, as I say, um, make a very clear declaration, which would mean he'd kind of have to kind of resile from the deal he's done, then I think he would clean up. When you look at the past, what is it now, three and a half years, what has, what has this whole Brexit, uh, Brexit fiasco, what, what is what does it reveal to you about Britain? Has it mm. revealed anything new? Well, it revealed to me uh, on the day that the referendum result was announced. Um, it was, a to me, an absolutely stunning day. Yes. I mean, Were I you had, expecting it at the moment? Did you, did you think it was going to happen? Uh, I thought it was, very, it was quite possible, mm. um, but I wasn't sure mm. at all. Um, and given what we'd all lived through, which was this torrential amount of propaganda that if Britain voted to come out of the European Union, you know, the apocalypse would descend, the apo economic apocalypse would descend immediately on the country. Um, and given how, you know, the, sort of the whole project fear thing, and that does work. And so I thought, well, you know, people are going to be very influenced by that. So I was um, uh, pretty staggered to find that, you know, what I'd hoped would happen had yeah. actually happened. And I had two thoughts. The first was Britain now has a chance of rescuing itself for the first time ever in my professional and indeed my entire lifetime. The agenda of the West destroying left have been stopped. The West destroying yep. left which believes that the very idea of a Western nation, the very idea of British nationality based on its historic traditions, culture, religion, language, literature, all of that, to uphold that is racist. Mm. And we've been told that, you know, year in, year out, expressed through the education system, expressed through the culture, people had it thrust down their throats, and look, they, that's what they voted for. So for the first time I thought, if you know, Britain now has a chance of regaining its identity 
and thus pulling itself out of the state of cultural demoralization, which in my view it's been in since the end of the Second World War, yeah. which made it prey to all these negative, West-destroying, Britain-destroying ideologies. Mm. So if it became itself again and thrived, then there's a chance that it can recover from its cultural demoralization. Yeah. That was my first thought. My second thought was, they'll never allow it. They'll never allow it. This cannot stand because the entire weight of that liberal intelligentsia, yeah. governing class, yeah. however, whatever you like to call it, is so strong, so overwhelming, and everything, they will throw everything at this now to stop it because they know they know they have to stop this. Mm. Brexit is both the symbol and the, the vehicle yes. for a renaissance of everything that they have tried for decades to destroy. So I knew this fight would be titanic. I didn't foresee precisely the calamitous entanglement that we're now in, mm, mm. but I knew it would be uh, a, fight to the, a fight to the political and cultural death, which is, what we're in, we're, which is why we're in the state we're in. It has been relentless, hasn't it, over the past three years? And I, I, I think there's also, when you look at the, specifically the House of Commons, where it's becoming clear, surely, to the, you know, the, even the most ardent Remainer, what is going on, actually. It's finally, the penny, I think, has is, is dropped this past couple of weeks, mm -hmm. even. Um, this is very dismaying, because there's always this view, oh, well, you know, Denmark, France, these, they've all voted twice, they all had to yeah. vote twice. We're not like that. That's right. That's right. Well, we're we're not like that. The well, British that was are not the idea. Like that. You know. Um, and I think, um, from what I can see and hear, and what people tell me and what I observe myself, the fury of the people beyond the charmed circles mm. of Westminster and the cultural bubble in London, the fury of people at what they perceive correctly to be a coup against mm. themselves, mm. Um, an attempt to thwart uh, the democratic right of the people to express their view and have it acted upon, the mm. right that Parliament itself gave them, mm. because they came up with a wrong result, their fury is excessive. Mm. And thank goodness this is Britain. Fury in Britain it doesn't express itself through street violence as so much in, you know, we see in Europe uh, goes on. It, you, know, people, you know, people in Britain are quiet. Um, they uh, they internalise it. It doesn't yeah, make the fury yeah. any less, but yeah. they express that fury through constitutional means, yeah. through the ballot box, which is why, as we now sit here, um, uh, the, uh, the elec general election, which is the constitutional remedy for a broken parliament, which is what this is, you have a yes. prime minister who cannot move, he's held hostage by his backbenchers in an unconstitutional way. He can't proceed with anything, really. Um, uh, government has kind of stopped in any meaningful mm. sense. So the remedy for that under our constitution is that you go back to the people, you say, I can't govern, I get, you go back to the people, they decide. Mm. Parliament's not even allowing the people to decide. This is absolutely outrageous. And so I think when the election finally happens, I think that the anger of the people will be expressed uh, through the ballot box. Now quite how uh, that anger will be expressed, i.e. what result that mm. will produce, given the, um, the fragmentation that we've just been talking about, yeah. the political fragmentation, it's anyone's guess. I think uh, the thing that strikes me about it, uh, which I think you sort of alluded to there, is that uh, <coughs> you know, people like 17.4 million or whatever, they, they now, they're under no illusions how they are regarded. Um, and I don't just mean by parliament, I mean by the whole establishment, mm. you know, racist, xenophobic, stupid, mm. all of these things. They might have had a feeling before that that was how they were thought, of, thought about, but it's been quite explicit, hasn't it? And they now have this knowledge. They have no illusions at all anymore. And I think that there, there will be some form of, of consequence to that, surely, won't there? Um, yes, I mean, I, I, I think people always felt that. They always felt that they had been you know, that they've been traduced in that way. And indeed, ever since the referendum result, that's what we've all been told. Everybody who was a Brexit, who voted for Brexit is by definition um, imbe an, an imbecile mm. and a racist bigot. Um, and that message has been hammered home mm. relentlessly. But there's also an, a number of Remainers 
who I would say are not ideological Remainers, but they're people who had a very, I mean, I don't agree with this, but th th their position, but nevertheless, I think it was a perfectly reasonable position that they felt that Britain would be worse off mm -hmm. and that it was, it was too much of a risk and that the consequences would be too, 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 too bad. And that's why they voted Remain. And I, I respect that absolutely. Um, and among those people, there is a, a great deal of horror and anger at yeah, precisely what yeah, we're talking about. Yeah. And among those people, I found to my astonishment, some of them have been saying to me, as far as I'm concerned, I want no deal. I just want out because yeah, yeah, this thing yeah. has got to stop. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. voted out. I didn't vote out. I voted remain, yeah. but we voted out and it has to be respected because otherwise we're not a democracy. They feel that very strongly. Um, so uh, I think this anger goes actually ac across that divide which has now opened up between Remain and Brexit. Do you think, I mean, being a, 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 what's it, wrong to say a creature of the media, I mean, so, g being a journalist, somebody who's been on countless shows, question time, and d across the board, um, do you think that the, the media certainly seems to me haven't learnt any lessons, it seems that they've kind of doubled down, I mean, would you say that's true? Yes, I mean, obviously one shouldn't generalise because there are pockets of the media which are uh, for Brexit um, and which have, you know, re remained so. Um, but, you know, the media, uh, without wishing to generalise, I shall now generalise, the media tend to hunt in, pa in a pack mm, mm. and they tend to follow one story. And whatever the story is, that's the story that you can't break without being regarded as kind of extreme. Mm. And... Uh, the whole Brexit thing is that sort of story mm. that, you know, f first of all, Brexit is, a, you know, a step too far. But if you're going to have Brexit, well, the only sensible Brexit is a soft Brexit. Mm, mm. And for three years, I've been trying to say to these people, there is no soft Brexit. You cannot be half in, half out. Mm. If you're half in, you're not out. Mm. You can't be out, but a little bit in. That's what a soft Brexit is. It's, it makes no sense at all. Mm. Um, it's merely a means of saying, well, we don't like Brexit, we'll really remain, but we don't want to be opposed to the people's will, therefore we'll have a soft Brexit. It's dishonest. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental dishonesty. I had this argument with people in the Labour Party. I remember having this argument on TV with Keir Starmer. Um, I said to him, this is, this is a lie. It's, it's a nonsense. It's, it's, it makes no sense. And he said, this is ridiculous. Of course, it's a, of course you have a soft Brexit. Mm -hmm. In other words, anyone who doesn't think of, a, of Brexit as being soft is by definition extreme. So anyone who, my view then, anyone who believes in Brexit is extreme. Mm -hmm. that is, and that is why no deal is so horrifying to people yes, yes. because no deal is not perfect. It's much better to leave with a deal, withdrawal deal. But nevertheless, the real deal that matters is the trade deal that Britain needs mm -hmm. to make in the fullness of time with the EU in order to make any deal your negotiating position can only work if you're negotiating a position of strength. Mm. You cannot be in a position of strength. The United Kingdom cannot be in a position of strength in its negotiations in the future with the European Union if it's a supplicant. It has to be able to say to the European Union, we're out of here. You want a deal? We'll be delighted to have one, but on our terms. Mm. Because that's what they've said to us. Yeah. You mentioned there uh, a while ago, Manny, which I, I think is a, so resonates with me, this point that when people voted, it was sort of like, a, right, look, actually, we're putting our foot down right, at this point. Um, and I wondered, you know, when you talk about the kind of reversal and the, and the, the demoralisation um, that's happened in Britain, and I would say actually in the West and, mm, and Europe, definitely. whatever. Um, when you look at that, it's something you cover in your book, The World Turned Upside Down, about this lack of resolve um, to defend or even to understand the basis of our, our civilization, Judeo-Christian basis of our civilization. Um, when you look at the so-called populist movements that you see in Europe or Trump in America, or whatever, do, you, do you think that that is a response to that? Do you think that, they are, do you think that, that is a form of response to, to that very degradation, as it were? Very much so. I mean, you've got a situation where the entire political establishment in the West um, has basically sung from the same hymn sheet for decades, mm. which with some variations has been basically, um, we have to be in a globalist world because, uh, not just because it's economically to our advantage, yeah. 
But because there is something terribly wrong with the very idea of the nation state, mm -hmm. in my view, this demoralization across the West goes back to the Holocaust and the Second World War. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say it goes back further. It goes back to the trenches of the First World War. And you could say that it's actually uh, wrapped up with the Enlightenment, the 18th century Enlightenment, which had the seeds of this destruction mm -hmm. because it elevated the individual, but that's a bigger and more complex argument. I can think you can certainly say uh, that the Second World War and the Holocaust mm. had a shattering effect on Western morale mm. because um, there it was, uh, one of the very worst crimes in human history, in the very, uh, the, the, the very crucible of high Western culture, Germany, mm. you know, mm. a country which thought of itself as so cultured so educated, it loved Goethe, it loved Beethoven, it loved Schiller, mm. and it produced one of the most barbaric mm. regimes ever known to humanity. And I think that did something terrible to the Western idea of itself mm. as the embodiment of reason, the embodiment of progress, and in particular, the idea that the nation did this that nationalism did this. Now, in my view, this was actually a mistake mm. because in my view, Hitler was not a nationalist. Mm. Indeed, Hitler despised nationalism as being petty and, and, and sort of narrow. What Hitler was in his mind was an imperialist. Mm. He believed that he was a reincarnation of the Holy Roman Emperor. Yes. He was going to restore the Holy Roman Empire. To that end, he had to occupy everyone else's country. And if Britain, hadn't been nationalist if Britain in 1940 hadn't had the strongest belief in itself as a nation defending itself against oppression and tyranny, but a nation which understood what it was founded on particular principles of democracy and liberty and all that, it would never afford Hitler. We yeah, wouldn't be yeah. sitting here today. Yeah. So this is a profound mistake, but that mistake has led people to basically negate the idea of the nation in Europe. So the peoples of Europe have nowhere to go. Mm. They have no way of expressing their belief in themselves as a nation, no way of, of, of articulating through a democratic process um, their belongingness to something, to a shared national project. And so since the entire political class has abandoned them on this, it's left a vacuum in which has risen up so-called populist movements. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these movements, in my, belief, in, in my view, are no more than movements which aim to restore yeah. a good sense of national identity yeah. and purpose. Yeah. And some of them are obnoxious yeah, yeah. and founded in racism and uh, all kinds of other yeah. stuff, Nazism, you know, they have Nazi backgrounds, but people have nowhere else to go. Mm. So that's why you're seeing this phenomenon in Europe. You started off in a completely different political uh, guise. You were uh, very much on the left, weren't you? And I, I just want to talk about anti-Semitism and racism there. Mm. This is one of the big, <coughs> obviously, issues of our time, the apparent inability of the Labour Party oh, yes. to mm -hmm. deal with this particular issue. Unwillingness, inability, call it what you want. Um, I just wonder, Melly, when you were on the left, were you in the Labour Party or...? I never joined any political party no, at, no. at all. Um, uh, the only isms to which I subscribe ever, have subscribed ever, are journalism and Judaism. Right, okay. um, I, belong by, I never belong to anything. But I, just, I very kindly mentioned my earlier books, but um, I wrote a, um, a book which was published uh, in paperback uh, last year by an American publisher called Guardian Angel. This is your uh, memoir, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah. which is a personal and political memoir. Yeah. But it's basically, it describes the, uh, the reasons why I moved my political position. And through that personal story, I believe it tells a story of what happened to Britain and the West yeah. culturally. And along the way, certainly, um, anti-Semitism played quite an important part in that. I just wonder whether, it, when, when you were on the left, even though you weren't in a party, whether you experienced left-wing anti-Semitism. I mean, did you see it then? You're talking about the 1970s, really. Yes, um, I only saw it tangentially when I was growing up. Um, I, you know, there were occasional remarks made at my family, um, but it was very much a kind of fringe thing. Um, uh, I don't think Jews 
um, like my like my family igno you know uh, they ignored it and they weren't it wasn't that they weren't frightened by it um, my mother you know every Friday night Jews Orthodox uh, traditional Jews light candles on a Friday night yeah. the commencement of the yeah. Sabbath and my mother would draw the curtains in case anyone saw mm. so it's that and British Jews always seem very nervous about that uh, and with some good cause but I didn't come across anything until I was at the Guardian in 1982 um, and at that point um, I, I should say I never thought, thought of myself as on the left. Right. I thought I was a liberal. I still think I'm a liberal, a traditional right. liberal. Um, but I thought at that time that the left and liberals were the same. Yeah, yeah. They all called themselves the liberal left. Yeah. And I thought that was true. I thought they were liberal and they were on the left. Yeah. And that to be left was liberal. And uh, what happened in 1982, as I describe in Guardian Angel, was that I was an editorial writer. I was a leader writer at The Guardian. And there was a, it, was a, it was a particular period, um, Israel was engaged in a very controversial war in the Lebanon. Uh, at that stage, I'd never been to Israel. In fact, I never went to Israel until the year 2000, never wanted to go, thought of myself as a British Jew, and Israel was for other, other Jews who were in need. But yeah. Britain was where everything was absolutely fine for yeah. Jews. And I was troubled by the reaction in Britain to this invasion of Lebanon. Mm. I didn't agree with it. I thought it was unwise and I thought they'd gone in too far and it was a strategic mistake, but I, it, wasn't my, it wasn't my issue. And out of the woodwork came this idea of the Israeli as the Nazi, mm -hmm. literally the Nazi. And to me that was anti-Semitism. Mm. And out of the woodwork also came the idea that all you Jews stick together. And I mm. thought, where did that come from? And I was very troubled that The Guardian was majoring on this war in Lebanon, but at the same time there was an, a, a, an atrocity in Syria. Uh, President Assad's father uh, caused to be uh, killed between 15 and 40,000 uh, 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 opponents yeah. uh, at uh, Hama, I think it was, I've forgotten uh, quite where it was, over the course of a couple of weeks. And that was a few paragraphs on a, on a foreign page, buried in the paper, whereas anything that Israel did in the Lebanon was, you know, major front page story yeah. and outrage, and editorial, and outrage columns. And so I said to my colleagues in all innocence, because I was a different person then, why do we seem to have a double standard? Mm, mm. And they looked at me as if I'd crossed a line. Yeah. And I realized I'd crossed a line. Yeah. I didn't know what the line was, but I knew suddenly I'd crossed it. And they said, well, of course, it's a double standard. You don't expect us to judge the developing world by the same standards that we have. The developing world is not brought up as we are to have respect for human life. So we can't judge them by those standards. That's racism. And I said, what? Yeah, yeah. You're telling me that if one is unfortunate enough to be born into the developing world, then one does not have the same rights to life and liberty as we do. Yeah. To me, that's racism. Exactly, yeah. To which they said, why are you so upset? We do you, and I become you. I'd stop being we, I become you. Yes. We do you the great honor of assuming that you and the state of Israel, I become the state of Israel, <laughs> which I'd never even been to, yeah. you and the state of Israel have the same concepts that we do, belief in life and liberty. So we judge you by our standards. And you tell us that you have higher standards than us, so we should judge you by higher standards. Yeah. And I realized at that point that uh, it's like a shattering moment. Mm. I realized they weren't anti-racist, they were racist. Mm. And I realized there was a double speak in which they told themselves their position was uniquely virtuous, mm. and that anyone who opposed it was uniquely unvirtuous yeah, yeah. by definition. Yeah. That was the line I'd crossed. And that it was, it was like, the Soviet Union, it was a mirror language, yes. a mirror morality. And I'd crossed two lines, one I'd opposed the left, and two, I had defended the Jewish people. And as a Jew, as a British Jew, you're not allowed to do that. What do you think when you see now MPs, Labour Party resigning, yes. has happened, what, what, what do you feel about it? It's that? a bit late. Mm. I mean, uh, to me, all this, I, I say, it, 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 this first emerged in my mind in 1982, 82. and then it kind of went away in my mm. mind. And it didn't emerge again until the year 2000, when the second, so-called Second Intifada started. Israelis were being blown to smithereens in pizza parlors and in cafes and on buses. And it went 
uh, effectively to war against the Palestinians in uh, the so-called West Bank to stop it. Thousands of Israelis were killed. And from the word go, in this country, in Britain, Israel was being blamed. And so I started to speak out. And as soon as I started to speak out, I'd never previously spoken on this subject in public or written. It wasn't my thing. I'm a, you know, as a social policy writer. Um, as soon as I spoke out, I became the Jew. And not mm -hmm. only the Jew, but the extreme Zionist warmongering Jew. And once I realized that, I started to read. And once I started to read about the history of the region, I realized not only how ignorant I was, but how the general, generally accepted beliefs about the Middle East conflict were almost completely wrong. And then I realized the enormity of the libel against Israel. And then I began to realize, because defense of the Palestinians and the belief in the oppression of the Palestinians by Israel is kind of the default belief among progressive people, I realized that their entire moral compass had disintegrated. And once I realized that, a lot of other stuff that I've been fighting for years about cultural decline and, and, and the cultural absurdity and the collapse of education and, and, and the, the, the rise of multiculturalism, the inability to say that a liberal society is better than any other, the inability to distinguish between truth and lies, yes. between justice and injustice, it suddenly all made sense. It suddenly all came together. Mm. Um, and so that's why I wrote The World Turned Upside Down, because it was turned upside down. But you've also covered this, you've written a novel recently, haven't you? Yes. And there's a, the Legacy. Yes. And, and the, the, basically you cover a lot of uh, the ground of anti-Semitism in that, don't you? Yes. Um, I wanted to write the novel because um, uh, I've always wanted to write a novel. Yeah. And also I believe there's more truth in novels than anywhere else. Right. Um, unfortunately, what I hadn't realized was that you know, I, 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 I've had difficulty getting published in Britain for a very long time because people do not want to publish me. It's sort of me. extraordinary in a way. Where, sorry, I say that greenly. But it's <laughs> extraordinary considering that you are one of the better known. And box con. office and publishers don't want to make money out of me because they don't want the views expressed. Yeah. But, that, but that, put that to one side. Yeah. These, both these books, Guardian Angel, my memoir, and The Legacy of the Novel, published in America right. last year. Right. They've had no publicity. Uh, you can't get them in the bookshops in Britain, but you can get them on Amazon. Anyway, The Legacy, um, I, exp I use the novel form to explore um, contemporary anti-Semitism in Britain but also more deeply, and I, I wanted to get into the head of an anti-Semite, um, uh, but also more deeply, I wanted to explore what I have come to believe to be the case, which is the, the fact that you can't escape your identity, how much you may want to. And so my hero, my anti-hero, is a, 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 a person of Jewish ancestry who doesn't want to be a Jew in Britain. And it's a kind of story in which he, he realizes that he can't escape it, and he wants to escape it. And he realizes the good things that he's missed by trying to escape it. And mm. he, it's not a satisfactory situation, yeah. and it can't be made okay. But that's what I wanted to explore, the pull of history, the inevitability of your identity, the, the, the historical, um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the fact that anti-Semitism is the longest hatred, it never goes away. So my book is set on not exactly a small canvas. <laughs> it's set, apart from being in contemporary Britain, it's also set in medieval Britain and in Holocaust Poland and in contemporary Israel and America. Right. So it's a you know, modest canvas. Okay. Um, but I wanted to explore this mm. idea that mm. these things are, are, they go through generations. Yes. Um, and um, I don't know, I mean, on Amazon, people have raved about it. They say it's a compulsive page turner. Um, uh, so compulsive, nobody has reviewed it. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're, you have covered pretty much the waterfront when in, in, in your writing. You say social policy, everything, right the way through. Um, you, know, you attract uh, a lot of anger in your critics. Why do you think they get so angry with you? I mean, uh, they do seem to reserve a certain anger for you. I'm in a particular know. circle of hell, unique circle of hell <laughs> is reserved for me. Um, well, you know, the old saying is, uh, uh, you know, an apostate yeah. is always hated. Yes. And I was considered to be on the left, and then I became not the left. Well, we've had quite a few on this show, actually. Oh, apostates. <laughs> yes. But I think it's more than that. I think it's more than that, because I think that the particular fury is um, 
uh, uh, the particular fury among a certain people of a certain age. I exclude younger people because they don't know my background. Right. But people of a certain age who you know know where I came from um, cannot understand what I've done, but they do understand that it's very difficult for them to label me as they're labeling me, as they've labeled me, as you know, right wing, extreme right wing, fascist, Nazi, because I clearly am not, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I still believe in the things that they believe in, or they say they believe in. I still believe in truth against lies, the oppressed against the oppressor, justice against injustice. I believe in opposing prejudice and discrimination and bigotry. I just believe that they are the bigots. Yes. And they are the people who stand for the erosion, er erosion of reason mm. and evidence mm. and facts and truth. Mm. But I believe in the things that they say they believe in. And that's their problem. Because I call them out on their own territory. And they have no defense against this. None. They can't answer the criticism. And so they never engage in the argument, ever. They have to shut me down. And they do so, or they try to do so, by first of all making sure that I'm not published. Mm. Okay, so I am published, but by the skin of my teeth. Yeah. Well, that was the case with Londonistan as well, wasn't it? Absolutely. It, was, it became a, a bestseller here, didn't it? But it started off in America. It was going to be published, this is a book about Britain, mm. which was going to be published only in America until about four weeks before publication, mm. when a tiny publisher, publishing out of his front room, came forward and said, I'll publish it. So he did, yeah. and he sold actually quite a lot of books. Yeah. So um, it's, this, it's this, I think, this understanding that, um, that I'm attacking them on their own territory. So they, they, they don't engage in the argument. They have to they try and shut me down. They do so by labels. Not just me, you know, so many of mm. us. This is what we're finding. So we're all phobes of various kinds. I've been so many phobes. I mean, you know, I, 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 you know I, uh, they seem to make up a new phobia to lay around my neck the whole time. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I'm extreme. I'm a racist. I'm a, I'm, I'm a mad Zionist warmongering Jew. I'm insane, <laughs> deranged, you know. So once I've be co been called a deranged, warmongering, Zionist, fascist, Nazi Jew, <laughs> what, what else? else can they say about me? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, hello, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, Millie, I want to say, uh, that's all we've really got time for at the moment, but the two books that you can get on Amazon, right? Uh, I want to just make sure people know this. Uh, That's very it's kind. basically the legacy is the novel. Yes. And then Guardian Angel is your memoir. That's right. It's Guardian Angel and there's a subtitle, isn't it? Guardian Angel, uh, my journey from leftism to sanity. To sanity. Great. Um, <laughs> both available on, on Amazon. Many, well, thank you so much for coming on and talking. Not at all. And um, all the very best for the, for the books that are now out. And I uh, hope you come back soon. Thank you so much. You've been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next week. And by the way, in the meantime, of course, please do remember to subscribe, won't you? Take care.